Well, welcome to number three of a series of the Sound As Ever podcast. And it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Matt, brackets, Doll Mavis of the Mavises. Hello, Matt. Hi, Jane. So lovely to see your beautiful face. Oh, you're <laughs> lovely. Thank you. And thanks for being part of the uh, Sound As Ever podcast series. Uh, it kind of made sense to... Um, to invite you to be part of uh, this particular series, uh, considering how loved the Mavises are. Yes, yeah, it's, it's such a long history in that scene. Mm. Um, I see your punters club. We literally grew up in that place, you know. I, I think it, I think it was yeah the first place I saw you actually. Yeah, I remember meeting my, my dear friend Simon Austin from Frente when he was working behind the bar there, and uh, and then they took off and. Yeah, he, he and I continued songwriting and stuff together and um, such great memories of that place, yeah. There was a lot of muso barmen who worked there. I, I distinctly remember Stanley from To Lot To Lot yeah. working the bar and living upstairs at one point. And wasn't Rob Clarkson? Oh, oh my was God, I loved him. him. Or, I yeah. loved him. <laughs> yeah, I remember everyone sat on the floor and it was like packed and everyone would sit down and listen to every word. He was great, yeah. So this is kind of like a, a this is your life, uh, if you like, because, you know, we, I, what we're, I tend to do with these podcasts is really go through the history. And, and you know, we focus on the 90s, obviously, because that, that was the decade. Uh, and that's what Sounded it As Ever is all about. But take me back to 1987, Matt Mavis, uh, Ballarat, you and your sister Becky. What was life like growing, in, growing up in Ballarat? And what was life like in particular in 87 when you decided to form this band? Well, I actually remember that I was wanting to, I, I got my first guitar at 16. Uh, it was 120 bucks. My parents bought it for me. I actually ended up using that on a, a few tracks. Um, when the Mavis is recorded, I, I used it on a song called Do You Have a Brother? That, 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 that real sort of trashy sound. But anyway, I remember being, I think I was 16, 17, 16 going on 17. And uh, Becky said she had a friend who, Becky was too shy to even sing really, apart from like around the house with, and I was as well, we were really shy, but was desperate to start. And Becky had a school friend called Kath and she, she was 14 and she played bass. So her and I hooked up and we'd sort of um, sit in my parents' lounge room and uh, I remember we were, She'd play like uh, Man Overboard by Do Re Me on the bass and stuff like that. We were thinking, how do we start a band? What do we do? It's like, okay, what do we do? We'll, we'll walk down the street. So we literally walked down the main street of Ballarat, hung out at the record bar there, which is still there. Uh, Black Swan Records, get our vinyl imports and stuff. We were just hang kids hanging around out the front and um, someone came up and said, um, oh, there's this guy called Droid. He's, just, he's from New Zealand. And he's uh, 25, which seems very old back then. Uh, he's got amps and he's got all these um, musical equipment. You should go, go and meet him. He's moved to Ballarat. So we marched over Wait. to his house, Droid, Andrew Craw. <laughs> <laughs> his nickname was Droid, yeah. Did he look so like a droid? He looks like a droid. He was bald, um, like shaved head and um, unusual looking, gorgeous fellow. We marched over and knocked on his door, us as kids. He let us in. Um, he had a pile of enemy magazines. He had all these really cool records that we had bands we had read about, like uh, the Slits and the Raincoats, and, uh, and he had all this on vinyl and uh, throwing muses that would just come out as well. And we were just like, "This is amazing!" And he just said, "Here's the amps, start." And he was kind of our mentor. And, uh, and then Beck uh, Coily joined in, and then we heard there was a girl playing drums in another band, and we convinced our friend to go and to, um, invite her over, and that was Andrea. So the next minute we had a band. I we were just sort of making up songs, and every um, chord we learnt, we'd sort of new chord put into a song, experimenting with time signatures, and I would kind of started playing a couple of months after that. Do you remember the first song you wrote? The uh, first song, the first song we ever did was a song that Droid wrote, actually. It's called Just a Little Shove. Can which, you remember how it went? Yeah, I still got the, it's actually, we actually ended up recording it as a B-side to um, 
Not roller coaster? No. Thunder, maybe? Thunder. In 95, yeah. I think it was a B-side, but um, it's with a acoustic song. We just put like a tribal beat to it and it's like three chords. It's a beautiful song, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Uh, the first song I really wrote uh, was a song called Shortest Day, which is kind of the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should re-release it. <laughs> you got to look at that one, uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah. But um, it was a very creative time and there was uh, the D Dead Salesman started not long after that. Uh, There's heavy metal bands, all different types of music, but we all really supported each other and we'd all come to the pubs and get kicked out because we were underage, but we sort of, we'd start playing in there when we were underage and then they'd wow. sort of turn a blind eye then kick us out. <laughs> <laughs> What happened to Droid? Droid ended up moving back to New Zealand. I, I caught up with him uh, many years. I would have been, I guess, 10 years later when the Mavises were touring in Perth around 97. Uh, it was a pretty awkward kind of meeting <laughs> because it was lovely, but um, I had partied a bit too much the night before because we were supporting Kylie. It was the end of the tour. <laughs> and um, I stayed up all night, went in the plane, and I wasn't well the next day. We had to end up cancelling a, a sold-out show. We did it the next night, but so Droid's thinking, oh, here's this guy, he's, what's happening to him? <laughs> he's falling apart. <laughs> yeah, he, he caught me at that moment, but yeah, he's, um, he had a, had a kid and was, yeah, it was lovely catching up. I think we caught up the next day in the park and had a chat. What do you yeah. think he thought of your success or the Mavis's success? I really can't remember. We, um, yeah, I, I, we were pretty determined back. We were pretty um, just ex so excited about what we we're doing, just the sounds coming out. You know, the first time we plug in electric guitar and hear that as a teenager, we were just thought it was the best thing in the world. So we kind of had that, that thing. It was quite naive, but it really pushed us. It's funny you mentioned that word determined because when I interviewed you very early on in your career, around about, around about the, uh, the Spindrift EP, I think, or even it could have been Poseidon yeah. even. You've been there for a long time with us, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I probably started my radio career around the time that you guys, well, certainly not 87, but around 1990, 1991. Um, so I, I remember you as a constant. Um, but yeah. you, you even used the word determined in your interview with me at Triple R. I remember that so well. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. just and I remember you saying, we just want to see where it goes. We just want to, we just want to see where we go, just want to be big, just want to just follow yeah. this, follow this adventure. Yeah. I was like that. I'm gonna play, um, I'm gonna take you back in time. I'm going to play uh Oh, whoops, I don't want you to see my ethical dilemmas. Um, <laughs> stop sharing. <laughs> uh -oh. um, I want to get to... Um, uh, I can't see any of my glasses. All right, hang on. Trying to find... Um, I got I got one of your um, videos. Uh, well, I say videos. It's a song. Um, just to, just to um, take you back down memory lane a bit. Uh, it's one of my... It's one of the first songs I got into of you, of you guys. <laughs> me in at such a wild angle take yeah. me back to that take me back to that moment wow that was inspired by I, <laughs> a trip to melbourne when i was uh, i think 19 and i had um too many car seat tablets <laughs> <laughs> and i was feeling pretty freaky driving with a, a, a drunk driver and um i think that was where the initial spark came from i can still play that song on guitar actually yeah. But uh, that song, Nick had just joined the band um, and we literally found him walking, we wanted a second guitarist and we were talking about it in the 
our lounge room where we were rehearsing and he literally walked past we just ran out and asked him to join and he joined on the spot wow <laughs> that did, was one of the- could he play guitar i mean was a did he have to learn no he played guitar but wow it was literally we need a guitarist oh there's nick <laughs> Oh, okay. So you knew him around the traps of Ballarat. Around, yeah, he was. Um, he was the cool guy that looked very Jesus and Mary Chain, slinking around with Josh. Actually, he was friends with Josh, who later joined. Um, we knew he played music. Um, yeah, that was just one of those things that happens when you're young. It all seems to happen so quickly, like that. When you know. Can I ask how soon after Nick joining? that Becky and Nick got together? Because they were quite quite the couple of the band. Yeah, I think pretty much around, pretty much not long after, I think. Yeah. How and was then, that for the rest of the band? Oh, that was, you know, I'm sure it was, it was difficult at times because, you know, when there's, when people partner up, you're talking to two people instead of one person. And it's the same thing when Andrea and I would, you know, be chatting and they'll be chatting and you know different opinions and stuff like that but ultimately it was fine it was great and then they they broke up and remained the kind of family Nick is family and uh he's married and Becky's friends with his wife and as it should be <laughs> it's my brother. So, so roller coaster kind of set the ball rolling, really, for you. Um, you also did a couple of couple of session songs with Bo at um, at Phantom Toll Booth. Uh, I remember a couple of. Uh, I, yeah. I remember you had a track on Screaming at the Mirror quite early on in the day. Yeah, that was actually pre roller coaster. I think. Was it? Yeah, um, that goes back to. The first gig we ever did in Melbourne, it was just myself, Becky, Catherine on bass and Andrea on drums. And we drove down, Kath was the only one with the license, I think, or Andrea, drove down to, to Melbourne, it was really foggy. And we, I mean, we played at this at a uni and it was, like, it was called Garage to Gig. And we were the example band. I don't know how we got this gig, <laughs> but we were the example band of, and there was all these industry people. We played four songs. Uh, the drummer from Blue Rue and I remember mixed us and we were like such fans. And, um, <laughs> we did our gig and then they all started talking about us and saying, well, they should do this and they should do that. And we just kind of slunk outside and sat in the grass and chatted. And then um, that's when Byron Perry came up to us and said, you would, would you like to be on a compilation cassette? Oh. Which, <laughs> yeah. Which was Screaming at the Mirror 1, which we put Just a Little Sharp on, which is that just song. Just a Little Sharp, that's right, yeah, yeah. I recorded it in my parents' lounge room, with four track. And then we did the uh, number two, which is the vinyl, and then number three, early 90s, which was the CD, yeah. So Bo and Perry were very supportive and just, yeah, discovered us in our first little gig in Melbourne. For people who weren't aware of Bowen Perry and Phantom Tollbooth, can you give us a little background on them? Because they were, they really did nurture that late 80s, early 90s independent alternative scene in Melbourne. It's such a long time ago. Uh, I just remember Bo being uh, and Perry being just so supportive um, and so hands on. And they, I have a memory actually of putting together, maybe it was was one of the, maybe even roller coaster or something, being in their fan top thing, like sticky taping or gluing covers together. And they had piles of local bands that were helping. They had their own bands, um, Scarecrow Tiggy and Clown Smiling Backwards, which were very innovative bands and mm. great sounds and just so dedicated to Sonics and stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, so roller coaster comes out. A little bit of triple R play, a little bit of triple R support, and then you start gigging in Melbourne. Uh, around, uh, I think it's fair to say too, you weren't, you couldn't really play your instruments that well, and I wouldn't be speaking out of turn if I said that because you were kind of learning as you were going along, weren't you? Yeah, we were. We were, um, as I said, every every sort of new chord we discover, we would sort of put it into. I was just frantically writing. I've still got piles of cassettes. I would just write all the time. And um, 
But we're pretty looking back. We pr- played pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, trying to relearn some of those songs, the really early ones. It's all very frantic and <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, we're learning as we're going. When did you settle on the Mavis's name, and where'd you get it from? Okay, uh, literally, I think as we were rehearsing in Droid's lounge room. I, st- I love that name, Droid. I'm gonna. I love Droid. this guy. <laughs> yeah, oh, he's a legend. Yeah. So there's a cat next door called Mavis, and Mavis would wander in to the rehearsing. She'd sit. I think she did a a turd in the bass drum, <laughs> but she'd sleep in the middle of the thing. And we, as a joke, we just said, "Oh, we should call it the Mavises," and um, and because of the uh, ooh, <laughs> we like we, we liked the go goes and the fifty twos and the, the the apostrophes. So that's why we put the extra apostrophe that people still go on about. Ah, that can't. <laughs> that we did it on purpose, you know. Um, well, uh, there was great discussion that that the plural of Mavises was actually Mavi. Yeah, Mavi. <laughs> we, we later found, found out that. Maybe this is a songbird. So, oh. but we did numerology actually. We we're going to change it to maybe with the E, and we've tried all different ones with, but we did a numerology thing and it said the magical one is with the apostrophe of S. I remember there you go. back in the day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, in early 93, you released uh, Spin Drift, um, and that came out, uh, was it Slip Discs through MDS? Yeah, that was uh, our manager Who's, project. Ah, oh, okay. That, yeah. Okay, so, us. so at what point did you get a manager? At what time? At what point did Bernadette uh, enter the Mavis's story? Probably it was around that time, 92, 90, 92. And how did she? How did she see you guys meet you and then decide to take you on? She, from my memory, I think we were playing a gig at the Evelyn. And she just came up to us and she saw us and she said that she saw something magical and would she like us to manage? And we said, yes. So, yeah. So she releases the EP on her label through MDS? It was her, this is all, I'm trying to remember all this stuff. Yeah, her <laughs> and Gus, I think Gus was uh, working at the pub as well and they were kind of started, yeah, this, this label, I, I don't know if anyone else came out on that label or was just the name for the one off. The one off. Yeah. But I think it was MDS distribution. Yeah. I remember gluing those um, together. <laughs> I still got some of the covers, but there was thousands of them. DIY love, DIY. Yeah. Uh, then your second EP, Poseidon. Now, I am guilty as charged. Being in my very late teens, I would always pronounce this on Triple R. No one ever correct me as Poseidon, not knowing about the great ship Poseidon. Do you think I felt like a dickhead when I found out how to pronounce it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this had Moon Drone Gold, which, which oh, just... No. Wasn't it? Wasn't it? No, Wasn't it? Rocketing, rocketing. Rocketing, rocketing down, of course. Sorry. Thank you yeah. for the, um, yes, rocketing, um, which which I guess, you know, just got, I just remember it got a heap of airplay, a ton of airplay. At that point, did you think we're, we're kind of, we're getting somewhere? No, I don't think we ever really thought that. <laughs> we just okay. kind of always started looking forward. What can we do next? What can we do next? <laughs> Never quite happy with you know, always wanting to improve, I think. That's a, a, how I ever call it. Um, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, you had a sound at that point that was unlike anything else in the Melbourne music scene or, or, or even Australia. I mean, it was part of that Brunswick Street set. I say Brunswick Street sound because that encompasses all the bands that were around at that point. But you guys were definitely <laughs> unique and original. You couldn't compare yourselves to anybody else that was out there, if, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Again, I didn't think of it at the time. I probably, looking back on it, I, I have a, a fondness, but and sort of, yeah, particularly with Becky and I like, singing together, I just think I didn't appreciate how beautiful it was at the time and the, the harmonies that we did were so, um, we're just in sync. Like we, we did them 
was all in our heads and it just sort of came out naturally. Um, rocketing, do you want to take me back to rocketing, what you remember? It's got a great video. We'll have a look at it in just a moment. Oh, no. <laughs> what, what do I remember about rocketing? We recorded it in Carlton. Uh, now I can't remember the name of the producer. Um, first time in a kind of bigger studio, Lusha studio that I recall was fun. Um, what else do I remember about that? I remember being on the, uh, making the video clip with Douglas Brooke uh, on a farmer's property and knocking on the door to get permission to sit in the field and <laughs> spraying our dogs with um, vegetable spray or something. <laughs> Someone's got a green nose, one had a pink nose. And we didn't really think it all out. It's kind of, I can't look at the clips, but. You but, can't, why not? Uh, well, I kind of, yeah. It's just like a bit awkward looking at yourself. Yeah, what's awkward about it? I don't know. It's like, you know, when people, like we, we love looking at 80s stuff. Well, I, I like looking at 80s stuff. And I know that there's people in the 80s that go, oh, what was I wearing? It's cringy or I feel like that kind of about our stuff. Yeah. Oh, embrace it, Matt. Embrace I I, it. It's I I such a great time. I don't think it's anything, but. And you were so cute as well. You had such a cute face. <laughs> oh, blushing. Now, you mentioned Douglas Brooke. Are we allowed to talk about the importance of Douglas Brooke, the video videographer slash video producer coming into your life? Yeah, well, he was making, I made a short film and I we wanted to make a video. I convinced him that he could make videos. And so we used him for quite a few uh, on and also when we signed to Mushroom, I think he, he did Naughty Boy and Puberty Song. Yeah, so he was with it through the whole thing. He had a beautiful cinematic kind of eye. I think he did Moon Drone Gold as well, which is probably the one I like the most. Uh huh. Yeah, it's like the colors and stuff in that one. Let's have a look at a little bit of rocketing. I think I remember being mortified because Doug, when we saw it back, Doug had shot us from underneath, so it was a, a, a ghoulish. But uh, it looks good now. Looking. Back and what now. was going on in your personal life around this time, Matt? What was I doing? I was just furiously writing songs, um, going out clubbing, coming home from the club, writing some more songs. I was pretty much just doing that nonstop. And um, had you? Had you come out at that point to your parents or to the group or, did, you know, um, what was going on around that? Around that? Yes. <laughs> oh, Am I allowed, are we allowed to speak about it? I can speak about anything you want. <laughs> I'm just swapped dogs, but if you haven't noticed, I'll talk about her later. Yes, um, I, want to, I want to find out all about her. Coming out. Well, I didn't even, you know what? I think it was way back in Ballarat when... I had a girlfriend and then I met this guy at the pub that came up to me, <laughs> said something in my ear. I went, all right. And then we started going out together and I kind of made an announcement to Ballarat that if anyone's got a problem with this, come and see me. Did anyone have a problem? I'm pretty, no. Sorry. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, uh, years later, I, I, when I, 
had a girlfriend again. Yes, people which we start, must talk about. <laughs> people had a, a bit of an issue with that for some reason. <laughs> like, but, 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 it's like I'm just, I'm just following my gut instincts here and if, you know, young man wants to check out everything and explore and do what I want. Well, well, we should we should talk about that now, actually, because you've mentioned it. Uh, you did you ended up supporting Deaf Effects on a national tour, and yeah. lo and behold, you and Fiona Horn get together, which you know, as us Melburnians had always known you as gay, was yes, it was it was interesting. <laughs> and, and Fiona Horn writes quite candidly about the relationship in her memoirs in her biography. Uh, what was going on in your head at the time? You just want you were just like, hey, this is an adventure, and I'm. I'm going rolling with it. It was pretty much, I remember that day, because um, Beck was, Beck and Fiona were friends and Beck was a fan of Deaf Effects and I didn't really know that much about them, but I was like, I agreed to go on the tour and stuff. And I remember we did it, it was a few gigs in and I thought, ah, oh, this girl's wild. And I remember sitting at, we all had a, a dinner, I think it was um, Noosa, was it Noosa? Byron Bay, New South, one of those places. Um, we had a band afternoon dinner before soundcheck and I remember Fiona and I just kind of looking at each other across the table. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I, I remember knocking on her door because we had hotel rooms and uh, bringing a bottle of wine in the middle of the night or something and talking and then um, end of the tour, ends back in Melbourne, party at my house, Matt and Fiona, Kind of inseparable <laughs> <laughs> and yeah we wanted a really cool fun few years so it was a couple of years you were together yeah wow yeah. we had we were both very um opinionated intense people so we're, you know we had big arguments a lot of fun um a lot of margaritas a lot of laughs a lot of funny moments of um yeah just um People came up to us. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun time. I'm still great friends with Fee. Literally just um, chatting to her a moment ago on Instagram. Oh, she's doing some amazing things, really amazing. Um, you know, she she has, well, you'd, you'd know she's a pilot now and she's, yeah. uh, you know, really, really helping out with charities as far as, um, you know, assisting where she can with 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 aid and things like that in, in some of those third world countries. I mean, yeah. incredible story, but that's her story. <laughs> yeah, she's a bit of a devil. Like she likes to be doing things first, which is great, you know? Uh, and so, so then comes the, uh, then comes the, the debut album, finally, uh, after a number of EPs, um, you finally get to release your debut album. Uh, which were you uh, which was Venus returning in ninety six. Yeah. And you'd signed with Mushroom Records. So who did you deal with mostly there and, and, and how did that process happen for you? Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm trying to recall. Well Eleanor, Eleanor McKay. Yeah. She some she was keeping an eye on us and coming to gigs, turning up to gigs, and she was part of Mushroom's white label which they started four hunters and collectors, if I recall. So it was like an offshoot of Mushroom, a, a branch of it. I think they had also had Frente. Yeah, they had a number of good bands on that label. That was a good label. Yeah, and Eleanor particularly, she heard a demo I did, which was uh, six songs, which is a very stripped back version uh, of early versions of Me Sing Thunder. Uh, Seesaw, which both ended up on the mm. Mm. A six track cassette and I released it locally around gigs and stuff. And, and I recorded that actually, um, Simon Frente, he was like my biggest supporter. So they had been signed and um, they, he would hang out at our house all the time, uh, just off, I think it was Kerr Street, Becky's house, that's right. And he'd, just, he'd say, play me some songs, I'd play me some songs and I'd play him my latest song I'd written and he said, oh, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. And he said, I'm going to sneak you in. Um, Frente have done some recording and I'll sneak you into the studio after hours and record these songs. So 
he really helped. He um, so it snuck in the middle of the night, pretty much, and did those six wow. tracks, which Eleanor ended up hearing. Yeah, I think was it Robert Forster was recording as well at the time. I remember bumping into wow. him next door from the go-betweens. Um, yeah, I, so Eleanor heard that cassette and she went on a trip to Ireland, she said. She was driving me to listen to that cassette and it was like the soundtrack to her, her holiday. So she came back and you know, had fallen in love with the songs and signed the band. Uh, did you get an advance or anything like that? Do you remember? I mean, you know, they they say when they sign bands, you know, they give them an advance or, you know, did you get, did, did you sign for a certain amount? Do, do you remember much about what you signed for or if it was like a two, three album deal? I can't remember that stuff, no. But I do remember a rocketing. Okay, so we, we did this competition, a, a band something band or played for some band uh, competition or battle of the bands kind of thing on yeah. contest it was to do with APRA uh -huh. we play rocketing and we came we got a runner-up and a 10 and a, a deal with this is before this we got a publishing deal uh ten thousand dollar advance and we said okay. no thank you. so we said no to that for you a couple of years before okay so I'm not, yeah okay I found that piece of paper recently, the, wow. the little award. It's like a little cardboard uh, APRA. Because we got a question from the uh, Sound As Ever, one of the Sound As Ever members, Rob Goff. He said, I remember a Battle of the Bands at Melbourne Uni. It uh, was a Melbourne Uni Battle of the Bands at the Toast and the Mavis's Spiderbait, Gutter Snipes and the Throwaways played. Do you remember that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I remember playing with all those bands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember playing with the gutter slut, the gutter snipes a lot. We were pals. We we played. Um, were different in our sounds, but we. I remember being quite supportive of each other around that time, and particularly with them uh, playing a lot. But um, I don't remember that sp particular gig. <laughs> if I remember the time. <laughs> Uh, I've got a little bit of Moon Drone Gold. Let's have a look at it because, again, it's such a beautiful clip and you're so, so cute in it. We, we, we had a sitar. We actually dragged it around to gigs for <laughs> early on after that, and Becky would play the bang. It was like a, a one note in the in the chorus, I think. Um, and is it fair to say Becky by this stage had gotten over those initial shot that initial shyness and those nerves? Because certainly in that video, she's you know she's she's right there with you, next to you, you know. Um, I think Becky. Most of people's surprise was always pretty shy through the whole band. Uh, I think she came across maybe on video a bit more confident. But, um, yeah, she was quite shy on stage to, to, as, as well. She came out of her shell a lot and we'd all feed, feed off each other's energy and stuff. But, yeah, it was a, pretty, a bit of a battle with us, particularly interviews and we were all pretty shy. We didn't, we didn't have any training of how to talk. You know, we're just throwing in the deep end. And you think, do you think, you you know, if, if, if maybe the record company had given you some some media training or something that may have worked to your advantage, it would, would you know, looking back, would, would you have done that a little differently perhaps? Yeah, some guidance mm. to, to make us a bit more confident and relaxed and, and uh, clearer. Um, that would have helped, yeah. Yeah, not some training to be fake, but some training no, to be but just... us out. Yeah, a personality, let our personalities come out more. Yeah. It would have helped. Yeah, yeah. Now, around about uh, 1990, oh, God, what year was it? Pink Pills. I mean, Pink Pills was released 
I think it was 1996, wasn't it? No, nine, uh, 90, no, it was 98, actually. 98, because I was on Triple J then. Yeah, 98. Yeah. And you were, yeah, you'd received a, a nod for the ARIA Awards. Uh, well, actually, four nods. Best pop release, uh, cover art, um, single of the year, and song of the year for Cry. Yeah. So Pink Pills was really like a step up from Venus Returning, certainly where I was... You know, you kind of lost that Brunswick Street band edge that you had with Venus Returning. Not that that's a criticism, that that was your sound at that point. And then it was yeah. really interesting to see you kind of, you know, once, uh, you know, with the, the, the follow-up album, just kind of go next level with Pink Pills. Everything was different. Your sound was different. It was very electronic. You'd uh, brought in Cali yeah. for that. Um, and, you know, it, it, your look was different. Uh, you kind of embrace the space age and the synthesizers. Do you want to talk about that transition from the debut album to the second album? Uh, <clears throat> I don't think we really, we didn't plan anything. Obviously, we were always experimenting uh, with, with sounds and I was always wanting to incorporate more keyboards in there, but not overtake it. Like, uh, I was, we were named a synth band recently. It's like we weren't... <laughs> Went synth band at all. Now, if you're judging from Cry, <laughs> you can see where they got that that idea from. But yeah, yeah. if you're judging you on your body of work, no. <laughs> yeah, we were a rock band. Um, but I remember like programming like as a song. Um, we had a lot of trouble in the in the studio in Byron Bay because the the desk started melting like it literally <laughs> wasn't plugged in properly. Grinspoon, I think was it Grinspoon had been in before us and they had bailed. And they ruined it for you. <laughs> well, they, we didn't realise that it, it, it was kind of cooked, but we kind of got some um, some of the best tracks. We had a lot of problems in the start, but some of the best tracks of the album, I think, were from that tension. Uh, I remember that in um, Snow White Line, having to do that myself really quickly. Like we, we didn't program anything; we played, and there were certain songs where that slowing down, a click. The end of off the sorry song called sorry we had to make the click slow down and go back up a lot of different things but um yes some the uh, beck was in tears a lot of time well, not a lot of the time I mean, meanwhile beck, your drummer was falling madly in love with the guy behind the control deck yes <laughs> <laughs> i think that was the first album <laughs> oh maybe, so that happened sooner earlier yeah yeah so he was he was he was engineering both albums yeah but yeah there's a lot of um I was just a lot of stuff went wrong at the start of that album right everyone had their emotional breakdowns and stuff but it was all some strange energy going around that thing so we we did half the album in Byron Bay then the other half at Sing Sing right and um yeah just like I, I remember getting the new key the keyboard which is the classic sound from Cry the zzz, like kind of switching it on, just putting it on there without thinking about it. That was kind of the new, it was, it was just a, a preset on the keyboard. Wow. Cry changed everything for the Mavises, didn't it? Yeah. It did take, uh, yeah. It was quite strange hearing it on commercial radio. I remember seeing with Fiona, actually, when we flat in Fitzroy, and we would listening to all this changing the stations and it was on every station and these was like uh, the the major live, live stations it's kind of weird and you should know twain and <laughs> maybe what was that like for you i mean you'd work so hard for so long and you get to the point where radio is commercial radio embrace you um what was it like uh again i think i was always looking for ahead uh, uh, yeah never really um sitting back and enjoying stuff i was always kind of what what can we do next what can we do next we need to keep moving and do stuff and create write new songs write better songs um i didn't really like the attention there's some attention were you uncomfortable with the in attention yeah wow. was, yeah but, because um, because what was what was what's going on that, uh, i didn't um I'd go out a lot because uh, um, like to nightclubs and stuff after gigs. I always had my, my best friend Craig with me and people would just 
coming up all the time around that wow. time, surrounding you and just like, and yeah, Craig was my bouncer pretty much. He's like, enough, enough. <laughs> enough. But you know, that was like a small moment in time. But I no, can I so think. relate to that because I was going to goo on a Wednesday night at the Metro and I had to have, I had a girlfriend, yeah. Paula, that was my bouncer. She would just, she was rough and ready. And uh, if anyone came yeah. too close, uh, yeah, she'd send them away. I can, I can relate. <laughs> yeah, because I'd engage with people and start talking and then some people would kind of turn or try and, you know, get something out of you or, you know, assume that you think you're better than you are or something. And, yeah, yeah I, mean? I had a few of those. Yeah, yeah, and you, uh, you wanted to be nice. You wanted to appear to be nice so you didn't want to, like, you know, be rude to anyone or, or not nice to anyone. So you do your best, but it got exhausting, I remember. Yeah, it's it exhausting. I don't know how people continue <laughs> to do that. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm more happy to be sort of step away from that kind of thing and be an underground artist. That suits my nature. Tell me about supporting Kylie because that was next level. That was going, wonderful. Going on tour with Kylie. That was a something we were offered. That was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> So I think we've been offered to do another, like a rock band, but we'd done Green Day, so we thought, well, why not do... Well, what was that like? <laughs> what was the Green Day support like? Green Day was was wonderful experience as well. And did you yeah. make friends with them? Did you hang out backstage? Did you drink with I, them? Yeah, we were bigger drinkers than they were. <laughs> yeah, they were, um, they were lovely, actually. Uh, particularly, let me bond you with the bass player. I remember bonding with him. Yeah, we had some wild times with them. The first night we played at Festival Hall, actually, and they came back. To, we came back to our dressing room and they trashed it. <laughs> but it wasn't. It wasn't trashed. It was just like that chair's upside down. That chair's upside down. They were like waiting for our response. <laughs> we just walked in and didn't even notice and <laughs> started eating our sandwich. And stuff. Yeah, it was kind of punk, but not really that punk. <laughs> Uh, we did have an amazing, uh, wild experience in Brisbane, actually. We played an outdoor gig with 10,000 people at least. Uh, outdoor Brisbane show. We were opening for them. So there was a couple of bands before us. There was a thing up the ledge at the top. We could watch the stage before. And the band before us were just getting sausages, bottles, money, <laughs> coins, pelted the stage with shoes non-stop and we think we've got to go on next oh dear and then um we went on and it was on fully on for us i was dodging andrea had bruises from like coins hitting her i was like water bottles kept flying at me shoes i think it was kind of fun when he got into it and then they played and it was even worse it was it was kind of a fun thing i guess but yeah, that was pretty wild and so a complete dichotomy, uh, Green Day to Kylie. Oh, Kylie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what do you remember? The main thing I remember is the way we were treated by the crew, the band and Kylie was very well, very kind. They gave us a time for sound check. They never, because back then it was pretty rough. Like we were, yeah, we copped a lot of shit. Why? Back was a different era. Like oh. you, you toughened up. Like especially if you're opening for acts, the the road is pretty mean to you. Wow. Like, who do you think you are? Kind of thing. Okay. I won't mention from what bands, but, <laughs> but I do remember um, Kylie's with the opposite. So lovely to us. So we got to do our sound check. We have beautiful dressing rooms. We'd uh, yeah treat us so well. Bonded with the band. Bonded with her. Bonded. The whole experience was beautiful. Yeah. A couple of moments I remember seeing backstage was there warming up, doing a bit of Xanadu harmonies. <laughs> yeah. And Kylie's, from what I recall, was a very intelligent and um, more serious, very good listener and a very um, intelligent woman. That's what I recall. I haven't seen her for ages. <laughs> <laughs> What do you remember about performing Cry on Hey Hey It's Saturday and being presented by, oh. uh, by with Daryl, uh, by Daryl, uh, your, I think you'd got like a, a platinum single or something. I remember him presenting uh -huh. you with something. 
You'd made it. You were on Hey Hey. Yeah. Um, those record, oh, those, one of them's rotting in the shed. Um, I have one saved, a gold, <laughs> gold, gold uh, single or something, or album. Um, I remember being a bit like this. I'm a little bit nervous, but I've been being. It's me, out. Matt. You can't be nervous. Like, nervous. <laughs> being so nervous before. <laughs> Because it was a curtain, and we did our sound check, and the audience, live audience, was there, and the curtain was there, and we we're ready to go on. And Daryl came out in a dressing gown from his. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Just remember how many people you're playing in front of, and well done. And my mouth was like, I don't know how I'm going to sing. And what? Um, come on! What? I'm what wait to see if I can hit the high notes. <laughs> your parents must have been chuffed. I mean, they had watched your career from from those early lounge room days. I mean, to get somewhere like I mean, not only supporting Kylie and, and going, uh, you know, top twenty with with Cry, but making it to Hey Hey. Yeah, I think we won there three times. Yeah. Right. Jeez. But um, I think that was the first time Cry. Yeah. Mum and Dad were there. They were backstage. <laughs> <laughs> hanging out with Red <laughs> Simons and uh, Wilbur Wild. Our manager, Bernard, Bernadette, was hanging out with her parents. Uh, yeah, it was fun. It was very nerve-wracking. We did, um, we got the choice to either lip sync or do a live vocal. So we did the live vocal over the instrumental. Yeah. <laughs> um. So what was going on in the band? Because, you know, Pink Pills blows up, as I mentioned. You know, all these wonderful opportunities occur. Was there, was you know, was there a tussle going on? Was, was or, or was it all plain sailing at this point? <clears throat> well, um, lots going on, I'd say. Lots of um, different relationship, um, good things and tensions. Uh, everyone trying to be heard. Yeah, it's probably a lot, a lot to go into. Right, because uh, by the time Rapture you record Rapture, I'm I'm kind of guessing you're a little fragmented. Yeah, we were uh, fragmenting in songwriting ways as well. I think there was like um, Nick and Beck had started writing songs together. Uh -huh. We've been writing the whole time, so um, yeah, I had. To, thousand songs and then they started writing songs so we were incorporating their songs as well so they were kind of wanting to branch out of songwriters and stuff as well right so right in a band it's hard to fit everyone in all those ideas all those ideas in yeah mm. and i think that um has some of our couple of our best tracks on it but it's not my favorite all over, all over album but some of my what is your favorite album what is your favorite mavis's album um I don't really think about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like asking you what's your favourite child or favourite dog. <laughs> well, I like so certain songs, yeah. Um, I love the song Drive, which is the last song on the third album. I think that's a beautiful song that I wrote in the middle of the night, really on a guitar, trying not to wake the neighbours to come back from somewhere. <laughs> I was going, I was like, Ooh, like, so that's why I was sung in that high voice and I had a little tape recording of it and I played it to Becky. I said, is this something or was I just tripping? She goes, oh, this is beautiful, this song. So, yeah, that's one of my favourites. I um, remember you'd released Coming Home and by that, uh, that was like 2003 and at that point I was living in London and I remember that song getting me through so much uh, kind of homesickness you know I wasn't coming home but you know it was just really comforting to put that song on because I'd obviously known you guys for so long and just kind of feeling that connection to Melbourne so that's my little coming wow. home story <laughs> I, never knew. I didn't know that song reached that far, I thought that song. I really I'm sure. Song. I'm pretty sure Bernadette sent it to me with the video because I remember what putting the VHS cassette on in my living room in London, and you guys were in a boat. It looked kind yeah. of, uh, yeah. Yeah, boat was a fake sea. <laughs> Other things we do for music videos. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty. I was nervous about that, so I didn't. I slept. I was like, oh, 
Matt, nerves seem to be running through this whole narrative of the Mavises. Your nerves. Oh, it's just the uh, nervous energy of, you know. <laughs> um, you know, writing a song and, and creating is is not nerve-wracking, but then having right. to talk about that right. is kind of hard because you've said it, said it in the song, <laughs> what you wanted to say. <laughs> That's kind yeah. of then talking about yourself. Yeah. Well, there's musicians who make sense musically, but not so much verbally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So 2003, so Rapture comes out. It's, 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 you know, I, is it fair to say it was, it was well received, but certainly not on the, not on the, um, not the way that Pink Pills was probably given a push. It was well, kind of. It's No, it was even. Um, was it bigger for you? No, no, no. It was another story altogether. Like this, oh. the album didn't come out like until we broke up. Is so that, we, oh, okay, because I was living in London at this point, so. Yeah. Oh, so much around that time. <laughs> but, um, well, you broke up. Let's, let's face it. Let's... it. Yeah, I don't want to talk about all of it because I don't want to. That's all right. Uh, we haven't got time anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, the song, yeah, we, brought, we left the label after the second single, which was Happiness. Uh-huh, okay. Ways. Yeah. Becky forms uh, Junkatique with Josh and Nick and you form the Blow Waves. The Blow Waves, yeah. Um, that with, was fun. With Jamie from Love Outside Andromeda. Uh-huh. Oh, you're talking about the Beatles. No. Oh, mate, you've been in so many bands, I can't keep up. I know. Yeah, well, the Blow Waves was uh, <laughs> a big part of my a big um, touring fun gig. We kind of caught that moment in my space which was where people would come to gigs mm. uh, a lot of we, around mid 2000s so we had a lot of a lot of local melbourne support it was very freeing uh wild band we just sort of dressed up and just kind of glam rock discoed out went to europe had a fun time there <laughs> yeah they're still like my other family like bands are like families which have you know, and there's, there's arguments and you break up and that person's not talking to that person, but ultimately you are a family, dysfunctional family. <laughs> Speaking of family, let's talk about Nelly. Tell me the story of Nelly. This, this is Nelly. Okay, so this is literally, oh, a year ago, I went on my first Bali holiday. Uh, a friend has a place over there. It was, it was my, my birthday, a big birthday. So I thought I'll go over there for a couple of weeks. So the minute we get there, this is in Seminyak, this little dog starts, wanders up to me. And I just thought, this dog is adorable. I just instantly fell in love. She's about four to six months old. And then she, every day, she was my little guide. I'd walk to the busy street and she'd follow me back. Aww. Just uh, wasn't about food, it was about love. Oh. And she slept under the car outside the villa all by herself. Like, well, she was waiting for you, was she? Went to come out in the morning or something? You just noticed that's where she that, lived. That's where she lived, under a car. Yeah. So I'd go out, I'd come out, of, out after having tequila, so I'd lie on the ground in the car talking to her. And the last day I was just devastated. I didn't want to leave her. I was in love with her. And I, I had to take her back home. So I got back home and looked it up and it was like, oh, it's 10 to 20 grand, it's six months. So I, I thought, you know what? Someone said, do a GoFundMe. So I've never done anything like that before. So I just had enough videos to put a one minute clip together um, to tell the story and it, it took off. But then she got in February, so she had to go to, to Malaysia for six months. But what? During her stay in Malaysia, the Australian government put a ban on all animals coming in from Malaysia. Oh, God. Part of the journey and then there was months and months there that were like, is she ever going to make it? And then the pet movers got around it by eventually moving her to Korea for a few months. Jeez, she's been travelling, this dog. Another $11,500. <laughs> oh, my but, God. But, and then a, a year, a year it took. A year. Another, two weeks, and it's the best thing I've ever done. Better than any, any album I've ever done. <laughs> it literally saved me. Oh my god! It's been mutual. Oh my god! So how long has she been with you here in Melbourne? 
yeah, uh, two two weeks and Aww. two days or something. And obviously she's settled in very well. She's been amazing, yeah. She's almost like a, a cat. And I was, th I was thinking, I gave her a ball to play with. And she plays with it like a cat. And I was thinking, maybe she grew up with little stray kittens over there. And that's oh. <laughs> so sweet. much love. Yeah, I'm a dog. Very dog lover. Big oh, dog. What a great story. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for uh, asking. No problem. Um, I just got a couple of uh, questions from from the uh, from the Sounders Ever message board, uh, which I'll just finish up with. Um, it, two two that are kind of related around the Rapture album. Just answer how you want. Scott Thurling, who sends his love, by the way, uh, says, "Hi, love you." Be keen to hear how frustrating it was and any background story to the long delayed Rapture album. And then Troy Reed also says, why did the Mavis's original breakup feel so abrupt and did the final studio album Rapture get an official release? Well, I think you answered that and you said, yes, it didn't come out till you broke up. Mm. Yeah, around that time, Mushroom got sold to a different label as well. Uh, a lot of the bands were dumped. We were kept on the label, but we weren't given priority on that. I think they thought that we're now a commercial band and we're going to look after ourselves where we didn't see it that way as a commercial band. So the, I was just, I'm sure it's happened to many bands, it's, you mm -hmm. know, and we just, it wasn't working out anymore. And you know what, I, I'm, I wasn't happy that the band broke up, but we did. Mm -hmm. What Should was the back, back, what was the background and story with co-writing with members of the Go-Go's and by the way, fabulous t-shirt. Yes, it's got my Go-Go's. So they've got the, the apostrophe as well. Love it. Love it. <laughs> um, oh, wow. That's a long story. But, um, okay. What's the short version? How do I short? How do I short? <laughs> okay, well, we're going to go. So we're going to LA and New York to look for a producer for that third album. And so uh, the internet was new. It was 1999. I knew a guy from EMI through Simon Austin. And I said, he, Simon said, who would you like to write with you? You should write. And I said, I'd love to write with the Roaches and the Go-Go's. And so this guy knew Jane's email. So I emailed Jane and she said, yep. Yeah. So I went to Jane's house. Uh, she picked me up, went to Charlotte's house up in the hills. Uh, beautiful people. She was like mother nature, gorgeous, funny. Sat around drinking, um, eating hummus and uh, wrote, wrote a song for the third album. And I've stayed in touch with Jane, but more, more so Belinda, yeah. Uh, and finally, the, the last question is, uh, Al Jardine asks, what is the tuning for Seesaw? Aha, uh -huh. the secret tuning. Okay, hang on a sec. Oh. We get a musical treat, yes. Oh. So, it's actually... It's actually tuned the open strings, so that's normal tuning, but it's tuned to, so you tune the A up and the D up and the G up, so that when you go like that, it plays up, which is the N chord, and then the shape is like that. I can't tune it now, but the shape goes up and down this movement. If that makes any sense at all. No. Nah. <laughs> I'm sure it does to musicians, it's though. It's <laughs> tuned to an E chord, so that it's tuned up. Um, Matt Mavis, it's been great sharing this hour with you. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. Thanks so much for your time, and um, thanks for filling us in on the story of the Mavises for Sound As Ever. All the best with Stan as ever. And thank you, Scott.